Oh my god, I'm Timon and I'm a young 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 and i am a young and i am a young and i Namao Vishnu Panaya Krishna Pasaya Bhutare Shimadi Bhakti Padanta Shami Tanam and Namaste Sarasati Devi Gurvani Pajani Nevishes on Yavari Paskata De Sadarina Narayanam Namaskritam Naram Chevana Notimam Devim Sarasatim Vyasam to Toja Nashta Prayashu Badrisu Nitcham Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Otamar Shoki Bhakti Bhavati Naishtaki Nigamaka Padur Garitam Padam Shukamakaram Rita Javi Samitam Vivata Bhagavatam Rashama Mahoro Horu Shikavivakam Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shayad Veda Gadadhar Shiva Sari Gaur Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Starting a new week. Here's to the new week. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Sundari Priya, Jean, Terry, Jimmy, <coughs> and others. Nine online so far. We're going to spend our sixth day on this amazing verse from the Bhagavatam. That means we've spent more than two weeks on it because we had Prabhupada's disappearance day uh, last Wednesday. <clears throat> Tomorrow, I promise you, we'll be on to the next verse, which will be the next verse will be the 41st verse in the third chapter, first canto of Bhagavatam. But today, a few more reflections, meditations. Contemplations. Good morning, Manasa Govna. Good morning, Russell. Thanks for joining us. <clears throat> Thanks for commenting, making yourself apparent. It inspires me to see your likes and your comments, to know how many people might be in our little forum here. Thanks for those emojis, Manasa Ganga. Here we go again, sixth time. I'm sure you all know this verse by heart. But in case you don't, you have the book ahead of you. You can welcome to chant with me. Idam Bhagavatam Nama Parana Brahmi Samitam Uttama Shogicharitam Chakaran Vesha Nisriya Shaloka Shadanyam Sastiyana Mahat. The Srimad Bhagavatam is the literary incarnation of God. It is compiled by Sri Vyasadeva of the incarnation of God. It is meant for the ultimate good of all people. It is all successful, all blissful, as well as all perfect. Thanks for joining us. Rupa Manjari, thanks for joining us. Govinda Dev. <clears throat> the first uh, verse that we bring to bear on this is the 13th verse in the 7th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, wherein Krishna cautions Arjuna, Tribhir guna mayir bhavir e bi sarvam idam jigat mohitam nabhijanati mam e byam param abhyayam. Deluded by the three modes of material nature, which are goodness, sattva, rajas, passion, morinyanjali, and tama, Ignorance, the whole world does not know me, who am above the modes and inexhaustible. Even those who are in the mode of goodness, which means righteousness, nonviolence, peacefulness, consideration, sensitivity, looking out for others. Even those firmly, staunchly situated in the mode of goodness, like Lord Brahma, on occasion, they fail to recognize the extent of Krishna's powers from Brahma Vimoitam. Vimohan, when Brahma stole the cows and coward boys from Krishna just to test them, even from his position of goodness, which is the highest, most exalted position within this material world. And Brahma is omniscient as far as this universe is concerned. He created the universe. He knows everything about the universe. And yet Krishna comes from beyond the universe. There are 8,400,000 species within the universe. But the Krishna is not evoked. Krishna is not generated from any of the 8,400,000 types of bodies which are awarded to the living beings as a result of the karmic actions and reactions of their past life. Krishna stands distinct, apart from, and above all of the various species that we find in this material world. And so Lord Brahma, who knows everything there is to know in this material world, who is more situated in goodness than just about anybody else, still even he failed to recognize 
the extent of Krishna's glories. It says, Gunatmanas tebi ganan bhagmatam hitabhati nashika isharesha kareni arvavi makashik vahi bhupamsave miyakadi basha. In the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it says that scientists and learned sages and scholars and yogis may ultimately know the number of stars in the sky, the number of atoms in this <clears throat> earth planet, the number of grains of sand on the beach, and the number of molecules of air. They may be able to count those, but they will never come to the end of counting the unlimited guna, transcendental qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. After all, Ananta Shesha has unlimited mouths, unlimited tongues, and he has been chanting the glories of the Lord for an unlimited period of time and has yet to reach the end of them. <clears throat> so how can, and if Brahma can't do it, if Ananta Shesha can't do it, if Indra can't do it, then how are we supposed to wrap our tiny little feeble minds around the splendor and the glories of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We cannot help but be bewildered before the Supreme Lord, especially in his personal feature. <clears throat> it is said that where you find all wealth, all strength, all fame, all beauty, all knowledge, and all renunciation, <clears throat> not just some, we possess some little smatterings of these opulences, but the Supreme Personality of God is defined as that person from whom Aishurya Samagrasha, Viryasha, Yasasa, Jnanam Bhairagyas, Tapi, Sanam Bhagamitin Ganam. That person who is the repository, the origin of all wealth, all knowledge, all strength, all fame, all beauty, and all humility, from whom all these come and in whom they exist to an unlimited degree. That's the definition of the Supreme Personality of God. Someone says, well, true, wealth. Wealth, how can you say wealth is a spiritual quality? In the material world, you can't have all wealth, no matter how uh, affluent you are, no matter how many summer homes you have in Europe and the Caribbeans and spread throughout the globe. Um, you can't have all wealth. And every time you spend, then you have less than you had before. Your stockpile is reduced. So that having wealth is certainly not viewed as a spiritual quality. That's true. Most wealthy people are the furthest thing from spirit. They, in fact, many of them have sold out <clears throat> any hopes or aspirations or possibilities of making spiritual advancement in the pursuit of wealth. Chanaka Pandit says, you can either pursue wealth and sense gratification, or you can pursue spirituality and transcendental knowledge, but they go ill together. So it's a natural reflective um, um, <laughs> position to take that wealth is not spiritual because wealthy people are not spiritual. But all wealth, one who created all planets with all gold and all jewels, and all raw materials, and raw all ores, and all minerals, that's spiritual. <laughs> There's no limit to it. And no matter how much he produces, no matter how many planets or even universes emanate from the transcendental form of the Lord, he never becomes exhausted. All Ishupanasha says, Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasha Purnamariya Purnam Iva Vishishate. The Lord is by definition full, and no matter what comes from Him, no matter what He spends, you might say, He is not in any way, shape, or form diminished by that emanation, by that expansion, or that expenditure of energy. He remains full, as full as He was before the process of creation. <clears throat> There's no way we can comprehend that in our relative, limited in time and space, material forms. So, when the Lord, for instance, appeared to the boy Dhruva Maharaj, the warrior prince who had done meditation and performed devotional service and chanted 
Om Namo Narayana or Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Rama, Rama, Rama Hare Hare for six months as a result of which the Lord upon whom he meditated within the heart disappeared. Our Juva had his eyes closed and he was seeing the Lord within his heart and all of a sudden the Lord disappears and the shock of it the disappearance of the Lord from his inner vision was so great that he opened his eyes in uh, surprise and amazement, and then the Lord was standing before him. Mahirantas Chabutanam, Bhagavad Gita says, Acharam Charame, Shukshmat Bhattaraviga, Darashtam Chantike. The Lord is near and far. The Lord is in the moving and the non moving. The Lord is within your heart, and he's also outside, in the atom, in the hearts of all other living beings. So when Dhruva saw the external feature, the form of the Lord who had appeared before his eyes, external to him, he couldn't figure out what he was looking at. He was aware of the 8,400,000 species of life, which are spread throughout all the universes, reptiles, mammals, aquatics, Birds, insects, trees, moving, non-moving, human beings, demigods. This is what Dhruva said <clears throat> in connection with his darshan of the form of the Lord. Tiryang Naga Dvija Sarishva Deva Daicha. He's naming all the different species. Snakes, uh, demigods, demons, insects, marchabahi. <clears throat> and one thing that each and every one of the living beings who is embodied with one or another of these 8,400,000 species of life. One thing they all have in common, Dhruva points it out in this verse, matcha dabihi, they're all bound for death. Their bodies are composed of matter and from Brahma, the highest living being in this universe who's situated on the highest planet down to the insignificant microscopic uh, microbe or ant, they are all matcha bihi, they're all perishable. Their bodies are all perishable. They are all bound for death. And therefore, their situation is called sad asat. Sad asat. They are buffeted. They are tossed throughout the various species of life and up and down throughout the various planetary systems. Rupa, shtavishtam, ajate, mahad, anadi, anakam. So this form that I'm seeing is not included amongst any of the 8,400,000 species which are bound for death. This form is aja. This form is unborn, and being unborn, it dies. The other 8,000,000 species are described, jatashahi druvamitir, druvam janvamitashata, tajmarapriyate, natum sochtam harasi. Krishna says, that amongst the 8,400,000 species of life in the universe, everyone who took a birth will die. And failing to achieve Krishna consciousness, everyone that dies will take another birth. Everyone who is born will die. Everybody who's died will certainly, unfailingly, take another birth according to to the color or the flavor of their material consciousness at the time of leaving this present body. Here's the full translation of this amazing verse by Dhruva Maharaj. Oh, my dear Lord, O oh Supreme Unborn, I know that the different varieties of living entities such as animals, trees, birds, reptiles, demigods, and human beings are spread throughout the universe, which is caused by the total material energy. And I know that they are sometimes manifest and sometimes unmanifest. The whole material world, with all of its species of life, is coming and going. Bhuta grama saevayam bhutva bhutva parliya te. Thanks for all those verses. Prashad has joined us and he's coming up with all the verses as fast as I can refer to them. Thanks for joining us also, Lakshmi and Sringa Prabhu. Certainly honored to have you aboard. So continuing here, Dhruva says, and I know that they are sometimes manifest and sometimes unmanifest. The entire material world has periods of manifestation and periods of unmanifestation. Uh, when the Lord exhales, the material universes manifest and they stay 
for a period of about 311 trillion years, which equates with the lifetime of Lord Brahma. And then when the Lord inhales, all the material universes are unmanifest within the body of the Lord. And the living beings who have not achieved Krishna consciousness, they get interrupted right in the middle of their plan making, right in the middle of pursuing their mouse-like goals, appetites, and ambitions. The black snake of time, which has been hovering over their shoulder, grabs them. They are destroyed along with the entire universe. After another period of non-manifestation of 311 trillion, then again, Mahavishnu exhales and the universe is coming to be. Those living beings who were interrupted right in the middle of their plans during the previous annihilation are impregnated within the new creation through the glance of the Lord, who never directly touches matter, but who glances, and that glance is Sambhu or Lord Shiva, and they take birth again amongst the 8,400,000 pieces of life in just such a suitable form that they can resume where they left off. Probably someone says, well, true, how can they remember? They were sleeping for all that time. Well, they don't necessarily remember, but Krishna remembers, and he awards them according to their desires from a previous creation. Also, there's a fact that when you go to sleep at night, it doesn't matter how long you sleep, Generally, the last thought in your mind at night is going to be the first thought that you bounce up with you in, uh, in the morning. So this works against the living being because it ensures that even from one vast creation to another, he remains chained to the cycle of birth, death, disease, and old age in this material world. And it also works in favor of the devotee. Uh, uh, it says, No, that's not it. It says, Matir means recollection. It says that if even at the end of a previous creation one was on the devotional path but interrupted by the annihilation, just like the conditioned souls will be revived just according to their previous material desires, when the spiritual aspirant is then produced or manifested or impregnated into the next creation, he gets a fortunate birth so that he can then pursue and continue and consummate his spiritual progress from the past life. So Krishna consciousness is so powerful it's never destroyed, it's always maintained and preserved, so that even throughout an interruption of 311 trillion years of non-manifestation, those who are on the devotional path will appear in the new creation just in such a way that they can continue their Krishna consciousness, finish up their sojourn in this material world, and go back to home, back to God. And the Bhagavad Gita says, Prapya punya kritam lokam. Advancement on the spiritual path is so valuable that it never erodes, never perishes. It's to one's eternal credit. And even after the vast hiatus of a material destruction and non-manifestation, one's Krishna consciousness is never lost. He bounces back and begins or resumes from where he left off. Robert says, if you develop the transcendental qualities of wealth, strength, fame, beauty, knowledge, and especially valuable is the quality of vairagya or humiliation, then you enrich yourself. Some people who are misdirected think that if you worship the Lord, if you chant the Lord's holy names, you become God. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that is not possible. And you should not go down that path because it is an offensive position to minimize the position of the all-powerful Lord and to falsely exaggerate your own position and possibilities. In fact, God, if you look up the meaning of the word, it means one. You can never become God, at least not capital G-O-D, because the name means one, and you cannot replace the one who is Lord of all. No vacancy. Position is taken. Sorry. But the good news is 
that by chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, and associating with the Lord through sound vibration, through his holy names, one can become godlike or godly. Not capital G, capital O, capital D, but small g, small o, small d. We assume the qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yashasti bhaktir bhagati kenchara sarva ganastataste sara haro abhakta sikuto mahadgano manore tinasiti dahabati bhati. In the fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, it's asserted that those who are devotees of Krishna, who serve the Lord with love and passion, they attain all the good qualities of the demigods without separately endeavoring for them. They automatically assume all the qualities of the Lord. And what does that entitle them to do? It entitles them to serve the Lord. You have to assume the qualities of the Master in order to be engaged in the service of the Master. So those who attain godly qualities are employed by the Lord in his universal missions to benefit all fallen conditioned souls. And as a servant of the Lord, you basically enjoy all the powers of the Lord. Not at one time, but as needed. As needed. Prabhupada, a humble 70-year-old servant of the Lord with no money, no friends, no acquaintances, came all by himself to America in 1965 to spread the honor and the glories of the Lord and to teach anyone who would be willing to listen the words of the Lord in the form of the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of God. He had no resources. There was every expectation of failure. His patron, uh, Srimati Maharaji, who gave him a free ticket on board of one of her Sindhya steamships, pre said, Swami, I, I give you the ticket because you're so persistent, but I'm going to have to say I wash my hands. You go there alone, an old man in India, completely unfamiliar with the ways of America, unemployable, with no money and no friends. You're going to die on the sidewalk amongst the homeless people. She had no anticipation of Prabhupada's success, but Prabhupada had the dream. And the dream was implanted by Krishna and nourished by his spiritual master. And here's the key. Krishna will not give you the dream without giving you what it takes to fulfill the dream. And Anyas Chintayantamam Yejanab Tesham Nitya Yoga Sema Bahami Hum. Whatever you need as a servant of the Lord, all the powers of heaven and earth are marshaled to assist you in fulfilling your dream of establishing churches, temples, farm communities, and spreading Krishna consciousness and taking ground for the kingdom throughout the universe. Therefore, the servant enjoys the same powers as God himself. The most congenial position of power and intimacy is as a servant of God. And everybody in the conditioned material world amongst the 8,400,000 species of life, as a general rule, emasculate themselves by trying to be their own little gods, by trying to set themselves up with their own little sovereignty, independent of God, not caring to serve God, not taking God's desires into consideration, not calculating that I am created by God for a certain purpose. The result of the independent, un-God conscious mode of living is that you emasculate yourself. The tremendous powers which God is willing to use uh, through you and for his good purposes in the world are null and void in your case. They're null and void. And when you connect with the Lord in service, having achieved the same qualities and sharing in the same compassionate, loving, universal, all-embracing vision of the Lord, then you get access to unlimited, the omnipotency of the Lord himself. The prophet says, uh, if one is not situated in the same transcendental position with the Lord, then one cannot serve the Lord. 
to be the personal assistant of a king, one has to have the qualifications. There's a job interview. Do you like to serve? Do you see yourself not as all in all? Do you prefer to hear your name, your fame, your glories sung all over the world? Or are you non-envious that he who actually deserves it, who actually possesses all qualities to a limited degree, do you have not do you have a problem or do you not have a problem with him being honored, with him being glorified? So the qualification to serve the Lord who is apart from this material world, who has a unique, spiritual, eternal, unborn body, and who occasionally out of mercy and compassion for the fallen living souls appears as a historical personality within this material world, the qualification to serve that ineffable, spiritual, transcendental personality of Godhead is that you also step over from matter, from relativity, from limited consciousness and limited thinking and limited independence into Brahman. You have to become like Brahman, like spirit, in order to serve spirit. Mam chayavi bachane bhakti yogana sagunam samadhita tam brahma boya kalpate. Those who become Brahman by chanting my holy names Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, they elevate themselves to the lotus feet of the Lord, thereby to serve his purposes on heaven and in earth. Otherwise, Prabhupada says, Foolish people create great blunders by trying to understand the highest transcendental rasa or mellows that the Lord enjoys with his perfect servants without following in the footsteps of those servants. You cannot directly approach a great person. That's just common sense. You can't go to the door of the White House and bang and demand that the president prove himself to you, that he present himself to you. He's not accountable to you. Just the opposite. You're accountable to him. If indeed you do want to get the, uh, go in to see the president, you have to go through the secretary of the secretary of the secretary of the secretary. There is a protocol a system for getting into the association and presence of a great man. And that system is to follow what it is that his servants tell you to do. So without following the footsteps of such servants of the Lord as Sukadeva Goswami, who presents the science and the fruit of love of God by stages of transcendental realization, carefully nurturing the neophyte student and bringing him progressively from stage to stage to stage to stage to stage, nobody can understand what to speak of serve the Supreme Personality of God. It is asked, where is religion to be found? Is it in the scriptures? Is it in the verses? Is it in the churches? Is it in the forests where the yogis live? Is it in the Himalayan mountains, the secluded ashrams of the sages? No, Mahajeno Yena Gita Sapanta. The truth of religion is contained within the hearts of the devotees, and only those who follow in the footsteps of the devotees can understand the glories of the Lord and enter into his transcendental service. And therefore, Sukadeva Goswami does not begin speaking the Srimad Bhagavatam with the pastimes of the Lord and the gopis, the cowherd maidens of Vrindavan, and with Mother Yashoda and Nanda Maharaj, and all of his gopas, his friends. That's where Sukadeva Goswami ends. That's where he takes you ultimately, but he begins at the feet of the Lord. The first canto has to do with the creation of the Lord, and very carefully putting together the case for the omnipotence of the Lord, point by point, by chapter, by chapter, testimony by testimony, pure devotee after pure devotee. Sukadeva Goswami takes you first to the feet of the Lord, then to the ankles of the Lord, 
then to the knees of the Lord, then to the thighs of the Lord, then to the waist of the Lord, then to the solar plexus of the Lord, the chest of the Lord, the shoulders of the Lord, the neck of the Lord, and finally the tenth canto, the blossoming Shmiran Bhangi Trayaparicham Sachi Vishtina Dushtam. Uh, it is said, finally one comes to that smiling face of the Lord who stands in the moonlight on the bank of the Yamuna River, playing his flute, calling all souls to join him in the pastimes of love and devotion. Very carefully, Sukadeva Goswami, just like a parent, just like a parent gives breast milk, then they give baby food, and finally they give the solid food when the baby is ready for it. If they give the baby solid food too soon, it will spoil the digestion, spoil the health of the baby for ent its entirety of its life. Now let's consider another point. We know, those of you who have been following and practicing, that Vyasadeva compiled all the Vedic literatures, having to do Dharma, Arta, Karma, Moksha, all areas of human endeavor, yet he was still dissatisfied, despondent. At which time Narada Muni came to him and said, Bhavatona Duru Prayam Yasho Bhag in Ivashuna Tushida Manya Tardarshanam Kilam. Said you have neglected to describe the spotless glories of the Lord. So how do the spotless glories of the Lord come to us? In what way do we receive the spotless glories of the Lord? In other words, what is there in the Vedas and even the Mahabharata itself which is missing. What is it in the Srimad Bhagavatam which is missing in the Vedas and the Mahabharata? Because many of the stories that we read in the Bhagavatam are also there in the Mahabharata. They're also there in the Vedas. So why after having told the same stories essentially that he told in the Mahabharata, does Vyasadeva recount those stories and considering that that work, the Srimad Bhagavatam, is in fact the ripened fruit of all the Vedic literatures. What's the difference? Well, he takes you step by step. In the beginning, the very second verse of the Bhagavad Dharma Projito Kaita Bhautra Nirmatsarantam. He warns you, I'm kicking out any tinge of sense gratification, economic development, liberation, or religiosity. This is going to be all about devotion and pure love of the Lord. So what is the Bhagavatam and how does it distinguish itself from the four Vedas and the fifth Veda, the Mahabharata? It is that we see the Lord through the lenses of his pure devotees and ultimately being very, very carefully nourished and educated and elevated step by step by the great saints following the footsteps of Sukadeva Goswami, we come to the tenth canto. And what or who is there in the tenth canto that's not in the Vedas, that's not even in the Mahabharata? It is the celebrated, Prabhupada says, gopis, cowherd, maidens of Vrindavan, headed up by Srimati Radharani. Up until the point of the Srimad Bhagavatam, there has been no mention made of the most pure, selfless, exalted, exemplary, emblematic devotees of the Lord. That is found only in the Srimad Bhagavatam. In fact, Srimad, Mad means madness, and Sri refers to Radharani. So Srimad Bhagavatam tells about the madness of Srimad Radharani and the gopis who want to serve Krishna at all costs. When Krishna stands at midnight in the forest playing his flute, gopis leave their husbands, they leave their families, they get out of the house through the windows, they sneak through the doors. Any way they can, they abandon every material consideration in order to beckon to Krishna's call. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hari Ram, Hari Ram, Ram Ram, Hari Hari. And it's explained those gopis who couldn't exit their houses, their doors were locked, their windows were locked from the outside. They went to Krishna by leaving their material bodies and joining him in their siddhas roops, their eternal spiritual forms. So for those highest 
topmost devotees in Madhurya Rasa, the conjugal relationship with the Lord, who gave up everything to serve the Lord and to be with the Lord, Krishna says, Naparaya ham niravadya samira, shashadu kritam vibhadaya sapiya, yo mabhajan durjaya geya shrinkara samrija tava pratiyantu brahma. God declares himself in the face of such uninterrupted and unmotivated devotion as is exhibited by the cowherd maidens of Vrindavan. God, the possessor of all wealth, all faith, all strength, all knowledge, and all renunciation, he says, I cannot repay you for your spotless service, even within a lifetime of Lord Brahma, which we've already discussed is 311 trillion years. Your connection with me is beyond reproach. You have worshipped me, cutting off all domestic ties, which are difficult to break. Therefore, Krishna says, because I'm bankrupt, <clears throat> I'm incapable of repaying the selfless service of the coward maidens of Vrindavan. Please accept this benediction from me. Let your own glorious deeds be your compensation. So considering all this, how dare anybody who is not following in the footsteps of Sukadeva Goswami, how dare they presume, and for money no less, for pieces of silver no less, how dare they comment on the Srimad Bhagavatam, the spotless story of the absolute truth. How dare they insert themselves in the Srimad, the madness of Srimati Radhi, Radhi and the Gopis. They have no place there. They have no situation there. They're not invited to the party and they're not supposed to gate crash. And those who follow such unauthorized commentators probably commit the greatest blunder. It's like spiritual suicide. And here's the example which is given in the Padma Prabhupada, Avaishnava, that means one who is not a devotee, one who does not fall into the sip succession, does not fall in the footsteps of Sukadosha, Mutkodyanam, Putam Hari, Katamritam, Shravananaiva, Kartamyam, Sarpochishtam. <laughs> that verse, verse is, uh, it's Sarpochishtam. You can pretty much tell what Sarpochishtam refers to. Snake, right? sounds like a snake. So one should not hear from an unauthorized commentator not coming in the disciplic session. Why? The example is given. Milk is good. Someone may say, well, the Srimad Bhagavatam, if it's that good, what, di what difference does it make? Where we get it from? Here's the difference. Milk is good. It's nourishing. Whole milk, raw milk from the cow, nourishes finer tissues within the brain, gives you spiritual intelligence. But when the milk has been touched by the lips of the snake, that same powerful nourishing milk has poisonous effects. So as milk touched by the lips of the snake should not be drunk, similarly one should not hear anything about Krishna from a non-Vaishnava talks about Krishna from non-devotees are poisonous. If you're serious about purification, about the perfection of the human form of life, serious about tasting the rasa of the servant for the supreme, which Prabhupada says is the most congenial form of intimacy, then you have to follow the prescribed process. Evam param para praptam. Hear about the Bhagavatam in the chain of disciplic succession from Sukadeva Goswami, who describes the Bhagavatam from its very beginning and not whimsically for money or for popularity or to satisfy the mundaner who has very little knowledge in transcendental science. As some of you may know, I was a life membership director in Los Angeles for all of the 80s, for the entire decade of the 80s. And the job description of a life membership director is basically to cultivate the Indian community, teach them about Krishna consciousness, inspire them to visit the temple on Sundays and take darshan and donate to support our mission. 
They're a very big Gujarati community in Los Angeles. They have their own temple in Norwalk, the Radha Krishna Temple. And they regularly would invite Bhagavad Sapta speakers. They would regularly invite professional speakers from India to give a seven-day kata about the Srimad Bhagavatam. And these speakers, generally, they like to go right to the 10th canto because that's the scintillating, pseudo-erotic uh, uh, reciprocation between Krishna and the devotees. Um, they like to present that for their audience because that's how they know that their audience, who has no knowledge, no training uh, about spiritual knowledge, who don't take the proper precautions, who hear from anybody and everybody, they can take advantage of an uninformed, uneducated audience in that way. And uh, I'm sure he's passed away long since. He was a good friend of mine. He was a, a donor. His name was Magan Bhai Patel. And he used to be, he used to get, he used to tell me, Charu, we're going to have a sapta next week. So and so is coming for me, having a sapta, you know. And he was just so excited. He never missed a sapta. And during the saptas, the saptas are punctuated by kirtans and bhajans often. He would get up and dance and dance and dance. And he would also come to the Hare Krishna temple and dance and dance and dance. But I could never <laughs> fail but notice in his breast pocket package of Marlboros. <laughs> I'm saying, my goodbye. You've been attending these saptas for years. You never missed one. They're two or three a year. You sit through the old seven days. You hear it. You get up, you raise your hand, chant it and you still haven't been able to give up your Marlboros. <laughs> So why don't you consider hearing not just from anybody and everybody, but from a bona fide representative of Sukadeva Goswami. So we'll finish with this verse again from, this is just a, in the same neighborhood of the Bhagavatam as the one we're discussing here. We'll come upon it, I think, two or three days henceforward. It's the 43rd verse of the third chapter of the Bhagavatam in which it is said, Krishna Krishna it was penned at the time of Krishna's departure, 5,000 years ago. Krishna, after having uh, uh, encouraged the devotees and destroyed the miscreants and reestablished the principles of religion, he departed and went back to the spiritual world. And so the question is asked, Krishna Swadama Bhagade, Shwadam, having returned to his own eternal spiritual world and left off his earthly pastimes, and taken within him, taken with him, Dharma Gyanam, truth, religion, duty, and knowledge. He's the personification of those things. How and, and in his absence, as he departed, the previous age, Dwarpa Yuga, ended. And the current materialistic age of coral hypocrisy, the winter season, the Iron Age began, the Kali Yuga age. So consider the departure of Krishna, accompanied by religion and knowledge, and the arrival of the darkest materialistic age in human cosmic history, the Kali Yuga. How are people going to get light? Seems like everything is plunged into darkness. And the answer is Purana ko duno ditaha. Krishna left behind him the Srimad Bhagavatam, which was originally spoken by, Sukha, by originally by Vyasadeva to his son Sukadeva Goswami, by Sukadeva to Maharaj Priksha, and by Sutadeva Goswami to the sages at Namasharanya. And that Bhagavatam came down to us in the authorized line of the Subhika session, given to us by our spiritual master's divine grace, his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. So those who have lost their vision due to the dense darkness of the age of Kali will get light from this Bhagavad Purana, which is as brilliant as the sun. And we'll finish our six days of discussion on this verse by repeating the verse and its translation. Idam Bhagavatam Nama Purana Brahmi Samitam Uttama Shokicharitam Chakara Bhagavan Vishi Nisriya Shilogisha Danyam Swasti Anir Mahat. I think you'll agree with me that this was worth six days. Every one of the six days, every minute of every day. Translation, and we'll finish with this. This Srimad Bhagavatam is the literary incarnation of God and is compiled by Srila Vyasadeva, the incarnation of God. It is meant for the ultimate good of all people. It is all successful, all blissful, and all perfect. Om Tat Sat. 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. All four comments uh, that I can see, there are 25 comments altogether, but all I can see are four comments from Prashant. He's feverishly throwing up the links to all of the quotes. On the top of the comment section, Avaishnava Magodhyanam, lip milk touched by the lips of a serpent. Then the next one, Naparaya Home, Krishna cannot repay the gopis who have given up everything. And then it's switched now. Now Lakshmi Nasringa's comment has come into view. Nitai Gaur Harivo. Lakshmi has a beautiful 15 minute kirtan session every morning from his home, I think in Puerto Rico, isn't it? Don't miss that. I encourage you to catch that. It'll start your day off on the right foot, just like Motivational Monday, Transcendental Tuesday, and Wisdom Wednesday. We aspire to start your days off well. Govinda Dave, thanks for joining us. Uh, Russell, you're all coming. Manasa Ganga, the comments as they come in are flashing across the stream. Yes, it's confirmed. So if you want to uh, transfer your consciousness from the Northwest, Minnesota, Taruni and Jimmy, for instance, or uh, New England, and get uh, the sunshine of Krishna consciousness and some literal sunshine, join Lakshmi for his early morning kirtan sessions on the beaches of Puerto Rico. Good morning, Radhe Sham. Hare Krishna. So uh, joining us and liking, and uh, liking is good because it creates more interaction, which is always good for the Facebook algorithms. But it also helps me to know who is there. Uh, it inspires me. And right now I'm being inspired by those who liked. Hit the like button. Radhe Sham, Jimmy and Taruni, Prashant, Sanjay Sharma, Raleigh. Thanks, Raleigh. Lakshmi Nasringa, Govinda Dave, uh, Stoka Krishna, uh, Star. Thanks for joining us. Star Kecho, Sundari Priya, Russell, Anita Sharma, Jean, and... Uh, Manasa Ganga and Rupa Manjari. Thank you, all of you, for hitting the likes. Use the comments section as well. If you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. Tomorrow, believe it or not, believe it or not, <laughs> we are actually going to move on to the next verse in this third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, which will be the 41st verse, and that is also a nectarian verse. What verse does Bhagavatam is not full of nectar? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.